who has worked as a geologist in the Rocky Mountain West since she graduated from the esteemed University of Wyoming mm -hmm. back in 1981. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the last weekend I did all right, the weekend before, but not quite sort of good. She's uh, currently employed as a geologist with the BLM's Bureau of Land Management's Cody Field Office and has worked full-time for the BLM since 2002, so for 15 years. She also owns a consulting business, Hurley Geological Consulting, which provides consulting services relative to groundwater exploration and determination of mineral and mining potential for conservation easements. With the BLM, she regulates mining and oil and gas industry activities on federal lands and also manages their paleontology and abandoned mine lands reclamation programs for the uh, Cody Field Office. Since 2009, uh, pertinent to tonight, she has been the project manager for the most recent paleontological excavations at Natural Trap Cave, which has been funded by the National, National Geographic and the National Science Foundation in conjunction with the BLM. Tonight, she will provide a summary of this fascinating cave's collection of Ice Age fauna and the latest information about the project. And before I ask you to join me in welcoming her, I want to ask, I'm just reminding myself to ask you to turn these things off if you would so that nothing goes off uh, during Gretchen's presentation. And so without further ado, I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Gretchen Hurley. It's a real honor to be here, for, um, to give you this talk tonight. It was a real honor to work on this project, which uh, wrapped up this year. Um, it is a rather long, intensive talk with a movie that I've got for you folks at the end that is absolutely breathtaking. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I guess we'll have a Q&A at the end, right, uh, John? Yes. OK, great. I am going to try to keep it on. Um, you know, on schedule so that I don't <laughs> overrun. Uh, the problem with this topic is so fascinating, I tend to uh, expound, so <laughs> bear with me. Tonight we will discuss uh, not just the cave. Okay, the cave is kind of where it all converges. Uh, I want to give you the big picture. I want to get back in space and time to help you understand a little bit about the tectonics uh, behind cave formation and also the, st the stratigraphy of the area, in other words, the formations that are responsible for the cave formation um, with structural geology as part of that uh, interplay. And then we're going to kind of work towards the main topic, which will be how Natural Trap Cave formed, how it was basically discovered that it was a world-class animal trap, and then we'll launch into the actual research that's been done in the cave. Uh, the, tr the cave itself is located on Bureau of Land Management uh, public lands, which are owned by all of us and administered by the BLM for you, for the American public. This cave is so special that it is managed as strictly for scientific research because of the world-class implications of the data that are coming from the cave. So we are very, very rigorous in our uh, review of who gets to go in, how they're going to work in there, and so on. Tonight, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Tonight we're going to, like I say, go through several topics, give you the big picture, um, and then uh, wrap it up with uh, the latest information from the current research, which, I, as I said, the project ended this summer. Uh, right now we have no one else that is planning to go into the cave. It's done. We're waiting for the annual report, or the final report. And so we'll go through all these various topics so you have a good picture of the, the background geology, the tectonics, and so forth. Uh, John, this is an animation that um, hopefully I can get to run for you folks quickly. But I don't know if I can with this particular uh, display. So you know what? We're just going to go ahead and, and, and move on. Because the following slides show the same basic thing. Uh, so if you can try to go back in time about 340 million years ago, uh, it's hard, but you know, <laughs> I could do that. And envision Wyoming back in what's called Mississippian time. The, the world looked like an entirely different place back then. The continents were arranged in different locations on the globe. Wyoming was part of a shallow continental shelf, very close to the equator. 
Uh, it was completely submerged by shallow, clean, warm marine waters, much like the waters of the Gulf today. And that kind of depositional environment allows for a very thick buildup of limestones, <coughs> carbonates, over you know, millions of years. And this is important to understand because this limestone that formed back in Mississippian time is the limestone that now houses natural trap peat. So Wyoming was part of a broad continental shelf, allowing deposition of these thick limestones. Um, again, here's sort of a global picture of what the planet looked like back then. Uh, the continents were much closer together. Uh, they were still actually kind of converging uh, to make one large mass. Um, but it's important to realize that, that, that <coughs> Wyoming, what's now Wyoming, was located along the western margin of that continental shelf. Okay? Uh, and during the Permian period, <coughs> 260 million years ago, that limestone that had built up over millions of years during the Mississippian was uplifted somewhat to allow some erosion to take place. And so we had lots of caves forming in the Madison limestone that were subsequently collapsing upon themselves. Uh, that term for that is paleocarst. Karst meaning a cave type landscape. Paleo meaning ancient. So ancient caves that would form, and we'll get into the formation in a bit, and then collapse in on themselves. And that's important as we move through the cocktails. During the Jurassic period, about 200 million years ago, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge began to become operative. And what that essentially was, was a split, it caused splitting apart of uh, the continents along that ridge. North America, let's see, I've got a laser pointer here. Here, of course, here's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And you can see South America and Africa were still welded together. They had not started to split yet. Uh, why is that important? As soon as you start to get the Mid-Atlantic Ridge operating, the North American continent, which had been moving east towards the ridge, is now moving to the west. And so the whole western portion of the North American continent is starting to see compression as it moves west. And what does compression cause? Mountain, Mountain building, exactly. So we start to get more uplifts along the western coast of North America. <coughs> You can see that in the schematic. Okay, early Cretaceous time. You can start to see the Cretaceous Seaway is encroaching in from the North Sea, that folks, coming in here. But we still have a cordillera that has formed, or mountain ranges that has formed west of that. Um, a lot of that has since eroded away. Wyoming, you can try to kind of follow it on these schematics, is located roughly here. Uh, the Madison Limestone, is still buried quite deeply underground, has not been uplifted yet, and the Bighorn is where it's exposed. So the Cretaceous Seaway begins to transgress. It will eventually connect into the Gulf of Mexico. See that? This is about 90 million years ago. This is what our planet looked like. And these reconstructions are phenomenal. They come from the, uh, Berkeley, California. University of California at Berkeley. You can find them online. Uh, and so the shallow, kind of lighter blue areas are the shallow seaways and continental shelves, and then you have the deeper oceans. But Wyoming, as you can see, is completely submerged under this middle Cretaceous this seaway for millions of years. Uh, gray shales and, and uh, more gray shales and some brown sandstones and so on were deposited. Marine reptiles swam the seaways. And natural trout cave was nowhere to be found. <laughs> Still uh, way before the cave formed. But I just wanted to give you this, uh, this, this little background. The seaway bisects North America to the Gulf of Mexico. At the end of the Cretaceous, about 65 million years ago, uh, of course, the dinosaurs died out, and the age of mammals began. You can see that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge has opened up completely between Africa and South America. You can see all the inland seas that were active during that time, but a lot of them are pulling off the continents with continued uplift and orogeny is taking place. The Laramide orogeny is the name of the mountain building event that resulted in the Rocky Mountains. And that event started about 80 million years ago when the first Rocky Mountain ranges started to be uplifted. I should, there, is, there was an ancestral Rocky Mountain uplift, but that was way before in the Pennsylvania. We're more interested in this more recent Laramide Orogeny, which took place from 80 million years ago to 40 million years ago. Why is that important? Because that orogeny, the compression of the crust, 
forced um, sedimentary rocks that had been buried up over above sea level, and they were then exposed to erosion. And mountain ranges formed and basins formed next to those mountains. And this is when we have things like caves forming. About 20 million years ago, what we call the Miocene to Pliocene epochs, another uplift uh, took place, but it was a broad general uplift. So the whole landscape is coming up as opposed to a mountain range here and a mountain range there and a basin there. So you're getting more of a broad general uplift. And that also is continuing today. This broad general uplift we still see happening. It's called the exhumation of the Rockies. And it resulted in um, renewed and accelerated erosional events west wide. So a lot of these basins were uh, excavated or uh, exhumed by the increased erosional rates. Think of a chainsaw cutting down through wood. If the wood is being lifted and the chainsaw cuts down to match that, you're going to get an accelerated uh, cut through the wood. And that's what basically happened with the exhumation of the Rockies. So Natural Trap Cave kind of started to form during that time. I'm going to show you some photos too. This is basically my little uh, schematic that I always use in my talks because it's so excellent. And I like my audiences to have a bigger picture. I want you to see the back story, if you will. So, we skip to the Pleistocene, which of course is the beginning of the Ice Age period. Two million years ago to 15,000 <coughs> years ago. This is what our planet looked like. The continental ice sheets, of course, had encroached far down into the continent. Not just in North America, but also in Europe. Uh, Natural Trap Cave was basically covered with ice at this point. Um, and so, uh, the cave was, was there waiting, but was starting to form starting to open up. You have various glaciers that come and go, and in between the glaciation periods are called interglacial periods of warming. So you have cooling, the glaciers um, advance, and this is not just continental, but also alpine glaciers that we have here in this area. The Wyoming was never affected by those continental ice sheets, only by alpine glaciers in the mountain ranges. Okay, totally different kinds of, <coughs> of glaciers. So we have glaciations and interglacials. And during the interglacials, the Natural Trap Cave was actually exposed and animals started to be trapped, which we're going to get into. <laughs> okay, so the current epoch that we're in is the Holocene, 15,000 years ago to now, it's continuing. Uh, we may be going into what's called the Anthropocene. That's another talk. <laughs> um, Natural Trap Cave is still swallowing animals uh, during this time and, and actually does continue to do so. Some of them are human, just kidding. Uh, but the paleontological research begins in the 70s. So that's the quick backstory from Mississippian time all the way up to today as far as giving you an opportunity to see what the planet looked like. Okay, so that's the backstory to, to today. So uh, to summarize these glaciations, the most recent glaciation is called the Pine Dale. There were four or five major glaciations. And uh, what kicked those off may be related to some Yellowstone activity. Again, that's another talk. But the, the most recent one was the Pine Dale, which lasted from 30,000 to 10,000 years ago and covered the most ground with ice about 22,000 years ago. And then, of course, it started to recede as the climate warmed. Uh, there was another period of, of uh, cooling called the Younger Dryas that took place uh, about 13,000 years ago. Uh, but again, that, that was not a full glaciation, but it was something to be aware of for this area. So, okay, let's, let's move on to some other types of maps and so on. This is a map of Wyoming. Uh, color infrared and other types of color there with vegetation standing out. I just want you to see where Natural Trap Cave is located. It is a, a hole in the ground, literally 90 feet deep, that is located in, in the northern Bighorn Mountains in northernmost Wyoming. And this is what it looks like. It's nothing remarkable when you just look at the beginning, or the entrance of the cave. It has been covered with a grate because it's extremely dangerous. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the stratigraphy, the rocks in which the cave formed, the layers in which the cave formed. Um, and over to the left is this, what's called a stratigraphic column. And basically, these are very handy for geologists. <coughs> Whenever you're working in a certain area, you need to become familiar with the stratigraphy of the area. Uh, as 
much as possible. So the oldest basement rocks are down here below the flathead sandstone, or the Cambrian basement rocks. To put you on the map vertically, Natural Trap Cave <coughs> is located in the uppermost Madison limestone, what's called Unit A. Okay? So very old rocks, but a fairly new cave. Remember we talked about paleocarst, the ancient caves that formed way back in the Paleozoic that collapsed in upon themselves? This is kind of what they look like when you try to draw them in cross-section. So you imagine horizontal beds that have been dissolved by water, caves form in those beds of limestone, and then with the subsequent weight of formations above, those caves collapse down and amongst themselves. Okay? So the uppermost Madison limestone looks like this. It's called the Bull Ridge Member. It's a very messy, contorted, jim jimble jambled mess of limestone and breccia and some gypsum and some red shale, all just kind of gobbledygook together. But that is the that is the layer in which natural trap caves <coughs> form. In outcrop, see what I'm saying? It's kind of a wavy looking deal. It's just, it's been exposed to a lot of stress. <laughs> I know how it feels sometimes. Uh, a lot of uplift, compression, <laughs> dissolution, and then collapse, <laughs> and infilling, and then more stuff on top. So yeah, it's a very interesting, very distinctive layer in outcrop. This is actually shot from Natural Trap Cave. So that's what the country looks like. That's what the Northern Bighorn Mountains look like. Uh, structurally, I just want to touch on that because it's important to understand that when limestone is folded by tectonic forces and compressional stress, along, along the axis of that fold, you're going to get extension. As the rock tries to compensate for that extra space it has to fold around its dresses, uh, stress fractures form, and so you get more permeability and you're likely to have more cave formation and erosion along that stress. It makes sense, doesn't it? These are some shots taken from the Northern Bighorns, and they're just striking in there uh, to show you what those folds look like up there in the Northern Bighorns. Again, Laramide orogeny was the event that caused these. If you think of limestone being squished in a vise like this, some of the limestone layers are going to go up and fold, some are going to go down, and it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's essentially the mechanics behind it. So what you see here is... Uh, um, Still getting used to the remote, sorry. <laughs> this is the Bighorn Canyon, north, uh, flowed into Montana from the Yellowtail Dam area in the northern Bighorns. And this is a shot of the west slope of the Bighorns so you can see the fold and how it uh, beautifully curves through the area. I love this shot. This is a monocline. The structure is called a monocline. There's like a stair fold. Okay, just one stair. Imagine a staircase with one stair, just kind of like that. And the shot was taken from this other, the opposite wall of that canyon. It's called Porcupine Creek. I wanted to point out what the country looks like up there. This is, creek flows north into the Bighorn River and then into Montana. But this is a classic, gorgeous monoclinal fold, exposed beautifully with the stratigraphy, uh, the Madison limestone, let's see, is this thickness here. And you can see that that whole thickness has been folded. And then out into that valley, it, it's level again. It's horizontal again. So if you can imagine it doing this, and a very beautiful sculpting of the geology there. Uh, above that is a red bed layer, the, Amst the Horseshoe Shale member of the Amston Formation, very distinctive red beds that overlay the, the Madison, and often those red beds have collapsed into the, the caves that have formed in the Madison. So just briefly, cavern formation is probably reviewed for a lot of you folks. Limestone is made of calcium carbonate. It's very soluble in water. So if you have groundwater moving through, it's going to dissolve the limestone. It simply dissolves it. Once the water mixes with the calcium carbonate, it makes an acid that accelerates the dissolution. So it's kind of a feedback loop. You have more water, more acid, more dissolving, and you have caves forming. This is a karst topography schematic, uh, which shows the different types of features. 
Uh, you can have uh, sinkholes, passages, uh, breakdown rooms, stalactites and stalagmites, chambers, side uh, uh, passages, like I said, pools, the beautiful <coughs> pools that form, they're so still and peaceful. Uh, very little uh, action going on there, a lot of deposition of beautiful limestone forms, etc. So uh, when limestone dissolves, you get cave and cursed lands uh, landscapes, and when those caves sometimes propagate to the surface as a tunnel or vertical hole, then you have a natural trap. And what we've got in, with natural trap is indeed a natural trap. So to summarize, the cave form during the Pleistocene place, Pleistocene epochs, about two million years ago, to about 200,000 years ago. That was the time of actual formation of the cavern that we're going to go get into, okay? Just to put you on the timeline of the cave. Uh, as the opening began to form, uh, mechanical and chemical weathering caused rock to collapse into the cavern and it continued to grow, basically get bigger and bigger. Today, we have a 15 foot wide opening, pretty narrow really if you think about it, that bells out into a 90 foot wide cave that's 90 feet deep. Now 90 feet deep into the ground results in basically a natural refrigerator type of condition. And as you're about to see, it's a blind trap. If you're coming from one direction, you can see it and avoid it as an animal running across the landscape. But if you're coming from a different direction, you're in it, as you will see. So here's the view of the cave. See, it's a pretty unassuming deal, pretty basic. This is the view from southwest to northeast. And if you're an uh, American cheetah, for example, running across the landscape, you're going to be able to see that hole and go, oh, divert. However, if you're an American cheetah that's coming from the southeast to the northwest, perhaps chasing an animal that has already fallen in, <laughs> can you see what I'm saying? It's a blind hill. That limestone ridge right there is the blind hill. So if you're coming from that part of the slide across the landscape, you don't have a chance. You're in, and you're down 90 feet, and you're dead. It's kind of sad, but it's also kind of cool. <laughs> you feel bad for the animal, but on the other hand, it's, it's fascinating what we're, what we're finding. So, you know, is anybody a Star Wars fan? I love Star Wars, all right? So this thing just reminds me of the star -like. <laughs> It's so star -like, like You almost can envision it gulping after it takes the animal in. But just imagine a mess, right? Hearing that going in. And they have. We, we have brand new mapping schematics from this past uh, research um, project. Actually, the mapping was done last year. So if you look at this thing from above, here's the entrance. Okay. And uh, that's where the hole is, where the grate is, where the animals went in. But the actual cave goes in quite a bit more. It's, it's quite complex and intricate in its passageways. We have one main chamber, which you're going to see some great shots of tonight. And then there's a very kind of intricate and complex passage, roughly on the same level. And it leads to another big breakdown chamber. And then there's another set of intricate passageways that kind of dead end. We're, we're still hoping to someday find where this cave might have another entrance that you can get in, but we haven't got there yet. Uh, so that's it from the top. Plan view, if you will. From the side, this is what the cavern looks like. And you guys, this is hot off the press mapping. We just got this last year. Uh, we made it a requirement of approving the project that we would get all the data and all the maps that go out of it because they belong to you. They belong to the American public. So, from the side, you can see the entranceway, it's very narrow, and how large this chamber bells out into like a wide receptacle, if you will. <laughs> I'm going to keep clipping along because I'm getting short on time already. Uh, some of the resources that grow around the cave are rock mat, petrophyton, uh, mountain mahogany, beautiful botanical specimens that grow around the cave, ferns and mosses and lichens, if you're into that kind of thing, which I am. A view back up through the entrance 
shows that ferns grow around the edge, quite lovely. Um, some of the animals that live around the cave, modern natural history, <laughs> would be pack rats, wood rats, if you will. Uh, uh, that's a sage phoebe, I believe. And then uh, snakes, lizards, all kinds of other modern day animals live right around the entrance and make their, their living right there at the entrance. Folks always ask, what kind of cultural resources have you found? And indeed, some resources have been found in pack rat middens only. So far, there have been no arrowheads or human remains or, uh, say, atlet shafts found in the actual deposits in the cave. But they have been found in pack rat middens. So pack rats have foraged around the cave entrance and brought them into the midden. Okay? But we don't have anything that's been found in the actual deposit at the base of the cave. If a human remain is found of any sort, then the project goes from becoming a paleontological project to an archaeological project. <laughs> but so far, it's still paleontological. So let's uh, talk about some of the research. The very first research and discovery of this cave, as far as its richness for paleontological uh, data, took place in the 70s and into the early 80s. So once it was discovered, the University of Kansas and the University of Missouri at Columbia got money and teams together and they went down and they brought out phenomenal specimens. The best stuff, okay, actually. The best stuff came out during the 70s and 80s. They figured it was a Pleistocene trap and immediately began to find everything from the Pleistocene. Not everything, I shouldn't say that. We'll get into some things that are missing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you peruse this for a minute. Just take a look. I need a little drink of water. Thanks, Mike. I do appreciate that. Some of the animals that uh, are found are modern day types. We still have them with us. They're extant. <coughs> but most of them are extinct. Most of them are ice age animals that are long gone. Most of them became extinct right around 10,000 years ago, just if you can remember that date. Mammoth, Colombian mammoth. Um, camp, muskox. These animals used to roam our plains and mountains. All kinds of horses, zebra-like critters, big horn sheep, three different kinds of wolf morphotypes, wolverine, rabbit, uh, you know, BW beetles, just kidding. <laughs> uh, stratigraphically, this is what we're, we're see. We're fine tuning into the actual deposit itself, where the animals landed, okay, rotted, and then sort of were preserved. That's what the stratigraphy looks like. And actually, the, the strata is deeper and older than 28,000 years. But this particular figure, I like to show you because it's just clean. It shows you where uh, the best productive layers are and how old they are. You can see that most of the productive layers are have been dated between 24,000 and what is it, about 12,000 years ago. But there are also specimens that are older than that. Um, the Kansas and Missouri crews did great work, but they kind of left a mess behind. So in 2006 and 2007, the field office got some money and we cleaned out all the junk because we wanted to get, ready, get it ready for the next wave because we know it was coming because this cave is just too important. So we uh, hired a contractor and we hauled out all the scaffolding. Back in the day, they actually ran scaffolding 90 feet down to the base. Wow. No rope work, okay? They actually climbed in and out with scaffolding. Unfortunately, it was all there still, along with the other junk. So we got it all hauled out of there <coughs> and cleaned it all up. That was back about 10 years ago now. Um, so just quickly, this is a little bit of the summary of it. Um, if you can want to read through that. Some of the animals probably fell in, fell in, like wolves maybe were attracted to the odor down there and got a little too close to the edge and slipped in. Uh, 90 feet down, a wolf doesn't stand much of a chance. Um, but over time, the animal remains built up kind of into a snow cone, or a cone of de you know, deposit. And then, of course, snow and rain would fall on top of that pile, right? So some of the snow didn't melt. You know, once snow fall in there, it's not going to melt because it's like a fridge. So you have a snow deposit as well on top of all the, uh, the good stuff. So let's look at some of the groups. Um, I had so much fun putting these next slides together for you because the, the artwork is just phenomenal that's out there. The Colombian mammoth, okay, 
used to live in this area up to one and a half million years ago. Became extinct about 10 to 11,000 years ago when the climate warmed. The Colombian mammoth is the blue one. No other mammoth species have been found in the cave, so that must have been the dominant mammoth that roamed the area. Came across, most likely, of course, the Bering Land Bridge. One and a half million years they've lived here. Several kinds of wolves. The dire wolf is a large wolf, much larger than the gray wolf. Uh, they have been found in Natural Trap Cave. They first were documented in North America about 240,000 years ago, and again became extinct 10,000 years ago. Um, the Beringian wolf is sort of a morphotype of wolf that is, I don't want to say it's a cross, but it came across the Beringian language, and this is a new discovery from new research, the, the Beringian wolf, which we'll get into a little. And then, of course, the gray wolves that we have with us till today have also been found in natural track. Quite a bit of them. This wonderful creature. The short-faced bear. Huge, tall bear with a short, stunted face. Um, yeah, came over 1.8 million years ago and extinct 10 to 11,000 years ago. <coughs> Mostly, this guy is found in the form of uh, teeth, jaw elements, and occasional um, legs, but there's still lots more bear to be found. American lion, which are related to the African lion of today. We used to have a full-blown lion, that, you know, not a mountain lion. We're talking about a lion, like an African lion that used to live here, like Simba. <laughs> Uh, I like this slide because it shows you lion distribution across the world. Um, and the Leo group, the Pantera Leo is what's been found in America, as well as the, the Pantera Leo at Atrox, which is what's been found in Natural Track Cave. And that would be the, uh, let's see, the blue one. Well, the blue lion came all the way across from Africa. You can see lions have occupied the whole world. They're fascinating animals. American cheetahs, much larger and faster than the cheetahs of today, galloped across the plains and chased antelope primarily. The antelope is so fleet today because of evolving with the American cheetah. But the cheetah didn't make it, and the antelope did. The antelope was able to adapt to the climate changes. Yeah, so they, American antelope, in their various forms and configurations, have been here since three million years ago. Here's some of the different horn types that you find in the fossil record. Kind of unique. Kind of mutant. <laughs> mutant antelope. Uh, here's a great shot of a cheetah. A Pleistocene cheetah chasing uh, one of the American pronghorns evolved to get. Both species abundant in natural trap cave. Probably coming from that southeast direction. <laughs> so what's missing? Here's some things you'd think would be in there, but aren't. Saber-toothed cats, elk, and deer of old. Either these animals were too smart <laughs> or too able to jump across the hole they saw it, and they just no trapping of these critters yet. Also, no humans or VW bugs have been found yet. OK, so the current research project uh, was proposed first in 2009. It actually got underway in 2014, and that's what we're going to finish out the talk with, and then the movie that follows the talk, which I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly because we need 20 minutes for the movie, is absolutely gorgeous and, and actually takes you into the cave with Julie and her team. Uh, this team was proposed in 2009 by Dr. Julie Meachin uh, of the University of, or Des Moines University in Iowa, and it's uh, all about getting as many fossils and as much DNA and as much good pollen data and ash data and so on as you can to reconstruct the climate, figure out what lived back then and what killed them. Okay? In a nutshell, that's the research. Uh, so access is only one way. Single rope technique, rappelling down in, ascending back out, and boy, you better know what you're doing for that stuff. So we had special cave uh, Toronto members, cavers, spelunkers come and assist the team, and they actually became part of the team. So the team became very uh, interdisciplinary. Some of the gear that's used to go down into the hole, uh, use a brake bar rather than a figure eight, which I used to use back in the old days. The brake bar is much safer as far as uh, getting down into the hole. Uh, you basically launch from a little rim around the inside of the cave entrance. 
I've gone down once. It's life changing. It's just phenomenal. <laughs> this is my coworker Brian. He handles our cave safety for the BLM. We actually have cave safety experts, and uh, so this team of authorized scientists and expert cavers and volunteers worked together for four years to achieve what we're waiting for the report for. And you're going to see in the movie a lot better than I can show you in my talk. So that's what that's what it looks like in the cave. It's it's brilliant and it's beautiful and it's magical down there. You, you're, it's almost like you're transported back to the place to see. Uh, so yeah, it's there. The, it's some shots of folks working in the very uh, organized, gridded um, excavation area right underneath the entrance and a little bit out. Because if you can imagine uh, the snow cone. It's like a pyramid, or you know, kind of a cone that formed right under the entrance, so it's spread out a ways. So it's not just directly beneath the hole, it's also somewhat laterally out, okay, from beneath the hole. Uh, there are beautiful speleothems in some of the side channels, but not so much in the main chamber. The main chamber, it's beautiful, but it's, it kind of looks like that. You know, open limestone cavern, kind of reddish, with a lot of desert varnish. Some of the side, we did get photos of some of the side passages, and this is what they look like. With some, there are some beautiful uh, rock formations, some speleothems, but they're totally off limits to most folks because, again, we only allow people in who are qualified to go in and do the research. Uh, specimens are excavated from the, the pile down there at the bottom, and then they're bucketed up to the top, and uh, another crew of folks who doesn't want to go into the, into the cave, some folks didn't want to go in. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> they do the washing and screening up the top. Very meticulous work to get the fossils uh, washed, and these are all, you know, small rodents, snakes, birds. Uh, they're all Pleistocene, Ice Age. So every bone that you see there, every tooth, um, is, is important and tells part of the story. Okay, it's not going to be overlooked. So it's very carefully collected and cataloged and placed in a repository. Uh, most of the bones now are being held at the University of Wyoming, which is a good thing. Some of the others have gone to Australia because we have one of our scientists is doing the DNA work and he's based out of Adelaide, Australia. So a lot of his specimen work is done there. Uh, these are horse bones. There were four different place to see horses running around, and at least four kinds have been found in the cave, and that's what those lead bones look like. Up here you have a little uh, jaw of a little uh, rodent of some sort. Every piece plays a part. So uh, just quickly, we had some of the ash collected and run under a scanning electron micrograph to get better data on on the mineralogy of the ash to try to correlate some of that maybe with some of the Yellowstone activity. So that's part of the project. Um, during 2015, we got some good shots of the expanded pit and how it's gridded off. See how it's gridded off so that you can keep track of various finds. Uh, this, these are what Pleistocene bones look like coming right out of the side of the, of the, of the excavation. They're dark and perfect. And some of them are so well preserved they actually have DNA that can be used to look at genetics, paleogenetics. Here we have a place to see horse bones in situ. This is what they look like in place. Extremely well preserved. And a tooth up there at the, in the right-hand corner, a very nice enamel. You can see the enamel is well preserved. So as far as the ancient DNA goes, again, I said that is run, uh, that part of the project is conducted out of Adelaide, Australia. So it's truly an international project. And Dr. Cooper is working on the genetic aspect of this. Uh, he's also working with the University of Kansas to get older DNA from those older digs. We also have the University of Wyoming working on pollen research, phytoliths and all kinds of uh, fossilized Pleistocene plant remains, microscopic up to macroscopic. All this is going to tie together to recreate the environment, the paleo environment. So, <laughs> I'm going to summarize so we can go to the movie. And, and John, can you help me with getting the movie started here pretty quick? Um, to summarize, we're still waiting on the final report. Because like I say, we just had the final season. It takes a while to get the, the final report. It will be made public. Uh, it will be put online. Um, this is Dr. Meachin here. She's basically the one who got this whole thing kicked off. 
the, uh, so the sediment's been excavated, fossils collected, identified, and put in a proper repository for further study. Dr. Cooper is analyzing his DNA over in Adelaide with the help of some, uh, some folks, some scientists in Los Angeles. Radiocarbon analyses will help date all of these specimens, and get them in the proper context in the timeline. Uh, carbon isotopes uh, testing of tooth enamel will help dis discern what these animals were eating, what plants they were eating, what other animals they were eating. And so all this data, including the mapping in the cave, the new mapping, will con converge into a final report that will give us a much more state-of-the-art picture of what Wyoming, what the West was like back during the Pleistocene. Uh, some of the notable finds that have come out of this that we know of, a rare, complete Pleistocene age coyote skull, very rare. Uh, the bighorn sheep remains were excellent. Um, horse fossils, a wonderful cheetah, like a full cheetah skeleton was found. Uh, which will provide a lot of great data about the cheetah morphology and evolution. Part of the skull of a short-faced bear, more than has ever been found. And then uh, the Beringian wolf, which is the newest, coolest wolf thing going. <laughs> and it came from National Track Cave in our backyard. Uh, so now we're storing uh, these fossils, both or at all these different repositories, and all the folks responsible for the fossils and the project work together as a team to make sure that everything's properly catalog treated. Um, if they need to do destructive analysis, they do so properly and every, everything is basically um, interdisciplinary in that regard. Uh, so, these folks will refine and reconstruct how Ice Age populations adapted and responded to environment and climate change while analyzing major extinction events in the place of same. And this is important. Um, it's important for us as we go forth into kind of some new times for us, climate-wise. Um, because everything is connected. What we're experiencing now was, is similar in a different way to what was being, uh, taking place during warming episodes then that caused extinctions of whole species, cat, a genera of animals in this area. Uh, we're really looking forward to the final report, and I really appreciate you listening to my talk. We're going to segue right into the movie, because the movie will, um, it just came out a few months ago. It was produced by uh, Barefoot Productions out of Australia, and what this movie will show you is how the research project worked, it'll take you into the cave, show you some of the things they found, and then wonderfully at the end it will show you how this information can be streamed live to school kids in classrooms and they can see these specimens coming out you know, as it's happening. And so with that we'll go to the movie and I thank you so much for listening and we'll have questions after the movie. Give me the, give me your head. Give me your head. This has got to be a patella. Is this something that we might be able to get DNA in? I don't know. In good shape, it's not broken. That is a giant patella. That is really awesome. Look at that. Look at that thing. From about 1.8 million to 11,700 years ago, 30% of the Earth's surface was covered by ice. The Pleistocene was marked by the establishment of climatic conditions similar to those found in the same areas today. This change resulted in a decrease in animal diversity both through redistribution and through extinction. 
for those larger Pleistocene mammals, this change ended their time on Earth. Natural trap came in the Big Horn Basin occurred on a plateau-like feature called Little Mountain. The cave consists of limestone and loose layers of silt typical of most caves. It has been recognised as an excellent opportunity to examine evidence extending from late Pleistocene to recent times. Normally, in breached caves of this sort, animal remains are deposited on a cone of accumulation directly under the opening. I've just descended 85 feet below the Earth's surface, where a team of scientists are finding fossils dating back to the late Pleistocene period, some 14,000 years ago. Any scientific expedition, a team of scientists come with their own unique specialties. For this expedition, geochemists, a geneticist, a vertebrate paleontologist, <coughs> fossil preparator, and of course, professional cavers. I'll uh, look for the sling so that we can send that down and then we'll do a haul after that. I think we should draw straws. Well, my name's Juan Layton. I'm a caver from Lander, Wyoming, and I've been caving since 1979, uh, caved on three different continents. The first year I heard about this project, this natural trap project, I uh, came up the, the second day they were here and volunteered my services, and then became the rigor, cave specialist, safety, and trainer guy. And so that's basically what I do is I train, vet and train all the people that go into the cave for vertical work. And this is a real handy setup to just do it right here next to the entrance. It's pretty technical. It's a 75 foot drop, but you, know, you can get messed up at 75 feet real quick. We're camping out just up from the entrance of the site, and we are about 100 meters up from the, the entrance. We don't have a regular hook. Everybody has a share of the hooking. We have probably one of the biggest issues is water. There's no water up here. This whole plateau is, is karst. It's all limestone, and any moisture that happens here immediately sinks into the ground into probably existing cave and fissures in the in the rock. <clears throat> what we have in this whole area, it's a typical karst area, is uh, cave development that's significant on in one major layer. So most of the caves here are horizontal caves, but a few of them have vertical entrances, including natural trap. It is because it's eroded up to the surface in the original phreatic development and then subsequent as the water table went down to cause that phreatic development which is a chemical dissolution of the rock at the water table as the water table drops then there's some collapsing that goes on and that caused this entrance to this cave what we have in this cave is what we call dome pits or areas in the cave where the ceiling penetrates up higher and you have like a cathedral dome. And in that area, we were hoping that there might be some upper cave development. There's deposition and there are bones below these dome pits. Part of this year's project was to survey the whole cave to better understand the, the uh, what we call speleogenesis or the development of the cave, how it was created, and would give us a better idea of how the deposition in the cave is and how the bones were laid down. I'm Dr. Julie Meachin. I am a rotorbrook paleontologist, and I come from Des Moines University in Des Moines, Iowa. And this is Natural Trap Cave. Uh, this is a Pleistocene fossil site. Um, it's a sinkhole, it's about 70 feet deep. 
um, and we are finding a bunch of Ice Age mammals in here. And our project is basically looking at uh, change through time. Um, we're looking at aspects of morphology, uh, ancient DNA. Um, we're also looking at aspects of climate change. So we have lots of pollen data, and we've sampled pollen from that whole wall. So we should have a pollen record that's, uh, that's at least 38,000 years long. theory that there's been a snow or ice cone right. where the yeah. animals have gone and fallen down upon impact. Yeah. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, Larry Martin, who was the original um, principal investigator of this project in the 70s and 80s, uh, he had this hypothesis that there was this giant snow cone um, at the base of the cave in the Ice Age, and that when animals fell in, they didn't fall directly to the bottom of the pit or right under the hole. So they'd sort of fall to the side and they would roll down this snow cone. Um, he thought it also helped their preservation so that their tissues would be more preserved and they wouldn't decay as fast. Um, and it was colder, obviously, in the Pleistocene, so it's probably colder down here. Um, probably got more snow. So the, uh, the thought of a snow cone is not, is not unusual, it's not out of this world. By using modern scientific equipment, the scientists are able to keep an extremely detailed record of where in the cave bone specimens are found. Well, that going to work. An orientation of bones can right. be used to determine how and when animals fell into the cave. The yellow instrument is called a total station. It's basically a surveying tool um, in order to uh, figure out exactly where points lie in space. So uh, when we set up the total station, we set it up over a point that had been uh, GPS coordinated in. So we know the GPS coordinates of the point um, that the total station um, is sitting on. And so by using that, we can get a precise location of all the fossils that we map into Natural Trap Cave. It's really important to know the location and the orientation of the fossils because we want to know a little bit more about how the animals died and where they fell, where they landed, where they ended up. Um, we want to see if there's any patterns uh, to, the, to the fossils, and we want to see um, if we can basically use these patterns to figure out the ages of the animals or if there was some other process going on in the cave that arranged the bones in a certain way, like water. Prior to this technology, we didn't have much technology. Um, we used a grid system. Uh, very much like the grid system that they used in the 70s and 80s when they first opened the cave. And basically we just used um, north and northwest, uh, southeast coordinates, basically, and we just cordoned off squares. And when a specimen was found in a square, we would just say it was found within that square, um, and we would try to get some measure of depth. Our depth measurement got a little bit more precise over the last two years. Well, what we first do is we uncover the bone completely, then we sketch the bone into a pad, a uh, little notepad, and then we choose a couple of points to shoot in. Now for something as large as a bison bone, we might have four or five different um, points that we choose on the bone itself to shoot in uh, to space to see uh, the orientation of the bone. So we choose those points, and then we take a photograph of the bone, uh, we assign it a specimen number, and then we use the total station to actually shoot those points in in sequence. We're gonna take all the total station data, and we're going to um, analyze it. We're gonna look for patterns. We will use some other folks' folks expertise, um, and they will do our data analysis for us so we can get a really clear map of where the fossils lie in the cave. I'm a researcher at the University of Adelaide and I'm here at the Natural Trap Cave excavation representing the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA. So I'll be doing the DNA work on all the bones that we're pulling out. What we're hoping to achieve by uh, extracting and sequencing the DNA from the bones that we're pulling out of the excavation 
is to really uh, try and understand what species are present, uh, where those species came from, what the genetic diversity of the species around the natural trap cave was like in the past, uh, and that can sort of help us to understand how the community, the animal community around the cave has changed over the last 30,000 years during a period of pretty rapid climate change. So what I'm about to do now is take a small section out of a bunch of the bones that we've found in the cave. And I'll put those bones uh, into a bag, label it up with the details of where we found it in the cave, what species it was, what element of bone it was. Uh, and I'll take all those little bone samples in their bags back to our lab in Adelaide. The ancient DNA work on the specimens from Natural Trap Cave can really help out with some of the other aspects of the research happening here. What I can do with the, the DNA is to confirm species identifications that the paleontologists here have made based on the bones themselves. Because sometimes, uh, depending on the bone that you excavate, you may not be able to assign it to a species. You may only be able to assign it to a family level. With the DNA, we can give a very confident identification of the species. One place that this might be helpful is in studying the, uh, the horse teeth that are being excavated from the cave. One of the other researchers on site is looking at the isotope ratios in the teeth to determine environmental conditions and diet of the horses that were living around Natural Trap Cave. But, there were at least two horse species in the area. The problem there is that we can't identify which horse species gave us which tooth. So what I can do with the DNA is to identify which species of horse each tooth came from, and then that can help us to look for differences in the diet of the horses. My name is Penny Higgins. I'm a research associate with the University of Rochester. I'm here as a geochemist and also a vertebrate paleontologist. Right, so I'm, I'm part of the Natural Trap Cave project because of my expertise in geochemistry. In particular, I work with things like this, this partial horse tooth. Um, I can take this partial horse tooth and analyze the chemistry of it and tell you something about what this horse was eating when it was alive and what the weather was like when it was alive. And that gives us lots of insight into what the animals were experiencing when they were alive these thousands and thousands of years ago. So horse teeth are of particular interest because, um, because they're very tall. This is actually one of the specimens we pulled out from right here. Um, this is a broken tooth, they're often a lot longer, but from this we can get um, about, it records about 18 months of the horse's life. And we can take geochemical samples along the length of this tooth and get a picture of what the weather was like at particular times of the year and what the animals were eating at that time of year. And that, that's part of the, the larger picture we're interested in and how the environment changed over time. The horse, there, there are actually two different types of horse in Natural Trap Cave. There are horses that look much like modern zebras in here and there are also horses that are called stilt-legged horses. This should be oriented like that. Yeah, so this should be... Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So it's a pathological. The next thing we'll do is we have this tooth and we'll bag it up and we'll, um, we'll take it home and I'll bring it to my laboratory. And what I will do then is I'll take a dental drill and I'll actually drill little tiny slots in the tooth enamel, take the enamel powder and put it into a mass spectrometer. Mm -hmm. And what I look at in particular are stable isotopes of carbon and oxygen. And oxygen tells me about the weather and the temperature and the carbon gives me information about diet. The work that I'm doing though, with the tooth enamel geochemistry is one small part of this much greater project. Another thing we do just right here in this area, we've actually shoveled out some of the sediment from here. We've taken it up top and screen washed it to look at the very small fossils, the, the microfauna, we would call it. Um, because from the, the small stuff, we learn about the little things that were alive, the rodents and the birds and the lizards and such. And that tells us a lot about, also, about the environment, but about how it affected the little things, and they tend to be pretty sensitive to environment, whereas something big like a horse, you know, moves around and gives us an average sense of the environment. So these two things together um, give us a much broader picture of the total environment, and it can help where when I'm looking at this horse tooth, if I have, my interpretation could go one way or another, from the microfauna, I can help figure out which way is the correct way. 
and it gives us a, a paints us a much more complete picture of the environment. Understanding the diet of extinct species is important in understanding how the climate and the environment have changed because as climate changes, as other environmental conditions change, the plants growing in the area will change and looking at what plants particular species are eating can help to explain their distribution or their presence or absence at a given site. There's still some uncertainty about the cause and nature of late Pleistocene climatic change. For the larger Pleistocene mammals, it seems likely that their extinction was due to habitat destruction on a massive scale. With science like this, perhaps the mysteries of this time when the great Columbian mammoth Rome and the elusive American lion ruled its kingdom, these questions to the long-standing riddles can be answered.
whole, whole you know, families went extinct. The mammoth, etc. Yes? Um, how cold is it in the cave right now? If you go down there, it's about 40 degrees. Yeah. So it's jacket weather. <laughs> yes, ma'am? You alluded to uh, Yellowstone activity perhaps causing extinctions? Uh, the Yellowstone eruptions, eruptions, the two million year ago Yellowstone eruption, may be correlated to the beginning of the Ice Ages. Yeah. The ashes that they're finding in the cave are young. And so they're related to different volcanic events, probably more related to the Snake River uh, plain formation rather than Yellowstone. Uh, you know, more recent eruptions. Yellowstone was last active volcanically about 70,000 years ago when the pitch stone plateau formed, and that's it, and nothing since then. So the ashes in Natural Trap Cave post-date Yellowstone. So try to figure out where they came from. Yes, sir? In South Texas, there's a similar cave to this, known as the Devil's Sinkhole. Devil's Sinkhole? Do you know if that has ever been researched, uh, the similarities and differences in the, in the two caves? I don't, because I've never heard of it. <laughs> it's, it could be similar. Texas has a different geology, but there is there is a there are limestone deposits down there yeah, similar okay, so similar to these, so it could be related. Yeah, it's good. It's a good question. Over here, Mike. Like, are they using a GPS in the cave? Mm -hmm. And if so, how do they get satellite signals? I believe they were communicating with another GPS unit up on top and somehow linking them, but I am not the one to ask about that. <laughs> Yeah, the toll station that they were using was communicating with equipment up on top. So how they did that, I, I don't really know. It's a good question. They were doing things that were just mind-blowing technologically. Yes, sir? We talked about mapping the whole cave mm -hmm. on that to this last three-year process. Did you get to the whole cave? I, I was confused at the beginning. Uh, the team that went in last year yeah. was expanded. It was like a special team that we sent in, yeah. and they did map about 98% of the whole cave. So they know sort of where the end is. Sort of, yeah. And they produced a really nice detailed map. So, yeah. We didn't do any mapping this past season, though. Any other questions? Uh, just, yes, ma'am? Hmm. We first heard that when you start building all the excavating, uh -huh. that was in the 70s. Right. When was this place that would be the fan? Why did these people go there? Um, Gretchen, locals. Gretchen, I'm not sure everybody is able to hear that question. Oh yeah, the question was, why did people know to go in in the 70s and, right, and start researching? Um, it was discovered by probably local folks who uh, knew scientists and just communication got the word around and, and uh, got to the right people who wanted to go in and look. And sure enough, when they went in, just you know, because human nature, we want to go check stuff out. Sure enough, there it all was. And it just went from there. Uh, yes, ma'am. How long do you think it caused? 10,000 years ago, you mean? Oh, boy. Um, maybe, maybe five or six degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is now, which is major. It may be enough to cause those extinctions. But that's an uh, educated guess. Could have been 10. Could have been 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was significant. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we have a question. Yes, sir. Is there any evidence of Native Americans exploring the cave or being aware of it? Native Americans live all through the area. It's very close to the Clo uh, Crow, what's now the Crow Reservation. But of course, it was uh, known by many tribes. Um, we don't see any evidence of them camping nearby, um, right at the entrance, although a little bit north of the entrance, we find artifacts and so forth from, you know, bands moving through. They're very interested in the cave for reasons that have to do, especially the crow, with visions um, held by their chief, Plenty Coup, actually. Um, I don't know much about archaeology, and I won't even begin to try to talk about archaeology, really, other than to say that Plenty Coup had visions prior to the uh, arrival of cattle onto the landscape. And part of the vision had to do with the buffalo being replaced by cattle. And the buffalo and cattle uh, were coming out of the ground. The cattle were coming out of the ground. This was the vision he had. And so there's a cultural tie uh, to 
Plenico's vision and caves. Um, I'm not going to go any further than that because I'm just not qualified to really talk about it. But if you Google it and look it up, there are a lot of people who know about it. And there's books about it. And there's, there's a connection there. Yes, sir? Uh, Beringian wolf, how is that different from the dire? The Beringian wolf is a larger wolf. It is sort of a transitional wolf between the dire and the gray, but it's not its own species. They call it a morphotype. So you have the Canis diarus, which is the big, formidable dire wolf. And you have Canis lupus, which is our wolf of today. The Beringian wolf is somewhere in between there. And the Beringian wolf found in the cave correlates with other Beringian wolf morphotypes found um, kind of in what's now the Yukon, you know, or British Columbia. Sort of what that, that pathway was from the Bering Land Bridge down into uh, North America. Yes, sir. Have you found any evidence yet of the paleo jackalope? <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting for the final report on that. <laughs> it might be the missing link. It might be there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. The bighorn remains, how complete are they? And have they aged them at all? The bighorn sheep? Mm -hmm. uh, full animals. Uh, I believe they showed in the layer that was um, around 20,000 years old. Yeah, and those are pretty much the same animal that we see today. <coughs> They're very stable, uh, very well adapted critter that hasn't changed a whole lot. Yeah, but try in the 20 to 28,000 year range. Uh, yes? Are there yeah. other caves elsewhere that have um, megafauna <coughs> skeletons such that with DNA you can um, look at things like distribution of them? You know, there are caves over in Europe that have animal remains from the Ice Ages. There are other smaller caverns that have trapped Ice Age mammals, but nothing like this cave that I'm aware of. This is world class and very much unique. Uh, other questions? Yes. Uh, do you know what happened to the American lion? <sighs> what did it in? It became extinct. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, uh, I don't. It, it became extinct, and then the, the American or the uh, mountain lion, the cougar, which probably uh, has not been found in natural trap cave, that I don't know of, I'm getting feedback, uh, took over. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know more about that. Uh, yes. Julie first got in touch with you in 2009 mm -hmm. when she started working in 2014. Can mm -hmm. you talk about the process that you went through to get approval? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> a lot of it had to do with funding. We had to, uh, she had to kind of put forth the project proposal uh, with us, with the BLM. Um, and also she had to gather up a team. Uh, but a lot of it was funding related. And before the funding was in place, we just couldn't really approve anything. So when she finally got all the funding she needed to do all the different facets of the work, then we could start getting the process really going. So 2012, we started the NEPA, what's called the NEPA process, and got the EA done, and they were in by 2014. Yes, sir. How much more work is there left to do, and how far are you down in all the layers you think are there? What was the second part? Sorry. Where are you in terms of the total layers that are there in the cave? Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, there's decades worth of work that could be done still in the cave. And the layers that are left, I'm going to estimate, uh, you know, you saw the pits, right? How deep they were and how much material was left off to the side. So all that still needs to be excavated. And then, so you can go out and you can go down. Probably another 30 feet. So there's possibly thousands of dead animals in Yep, they've taken thousands out, and there are probably thousands more. I, I, I read a report that calculated they approximated 1.7 animals per year fell in. <laughs> Whatever animal type that was, 1.7 per. <laughs> you know how those, those stats come out, they're kind of funny. Uh, yes, ma'am. Is there any effort to get the classroom interactive in this country? Uh, there will be. Actually, now that the project's wrapped up, uh, the scientists may actually be putting on uh, Skype presentations for classrooms in this country. 
Uh, those, those presentations went to other countries. Um, I would have liked to sing some more here in this country as well, but uh, that was sort of an extra side project that they wanted to try, going across oceans, you know, and hitting classrooms on other continents to let them see what was happening here. But it could totally be done here. And ideally, we'll get uh, school kids involved more with some of the, uh, at the University of Wyoming, for example, have um, science, uh, maybe programs, for kids to come and actually work with some of the fossils. The potential is limitless for that. Yes, sir. Uh, were there a lot of modern-day animals? I mean, you talked about as Pleistocene animals, but there were, were there a lot of modern-day animals that had fallen into the cave? This is at 1.7 yeah. animals per year, extend to present. Or uh, were there it, more animals running around in the Pleistocene? It's probably one of pulses, you know? <laughs> that's just, that's just yeah. like evening it out right, over. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, in fact, during the, during the research, animals fell in. <laughs> they had a wood rat that got a little overzealous. And uh, peeked over the edge a little too far, boom, right down into the crew. And, uh, you know, they he died on impact. Because he was up, you know, 50, 60 feet up, poor guy. Anyway, they called him Packy Le Pew, and they covered him with a screen, and they studied him as he decayed. So they made him part of the project. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, th I thought I went through it too fast. But yeah, did you see him? He was well protected. And he's been since collected. Uh, snakes as well fell in during the day. Can you imagine that? Here you are digging. Boom! A snake comes <laughs> rifling in at you. <laughs> so we have time for about two more questions. Okay, Mike, right? yeah. Because we could talk for hours about this. Right. Uh, let's see. I just wanted to make sure I covered everybody. Okay. Your turn. <laughs> yeah. Remember the picture of the monocline and that spectacular canyon? Yes, Porcupine Creek. That, that is in the northern Bighorns. It's called Porcupine Creek Canyon, or Devil's Canyon is another name for it. It's, it's unbelievable. And it's just, it's, you can drive right to it. You can drive right to that point where it put the picture. And stand there and just, I had no idea what this was. I mean, in, in its own way, it's as beautiful as the Tetons. And pretty solitary. Porcupine Creek, also called Devil's Canyon. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's east and south of Natural Trap. But it's in the northern big corner. Yeah, the northern big ones are kind of a series of stair step folds like that, about four of them, and that was like the middle one. Yes, sir. What was the percentage of like partial skeletons uh, versus complete skeletons? Oh, I don't know yet. Good question. Final report. <laughs> but I'm going to guess very few uh, complete articulated skeletons, because most of everything kind of came apart and mixed. But they found a few. Oh, there 